But uh, let me start by uh, coming first of all to Rashid. Rashid, can you perhaps introduce yourself and just give us some introductory comments on your view of the future of cloud? What should we be looking out for next? Sure, Brian. Um, <coughs> Rashid Palmer, I'm uh, currently the group chief exec for the, the BCS. Um, and you know, I've been working in IBM for, or worked in IBM for, for 39 years, helping shape a number of um, IT programs, transformation programs. When I think about the future of cloud, this is really about understanding how um, established processes will be transformed going forward. Um, so, so you think about different aspects of daily life and think about how we can um, use the power of AI, cloud, and, um, um, IoT, 5G, quantum, deep learning, blockchain, et cetera, and, and harness those on aspects of business process, which will then get automated, simplified, made much more efficient, and give us the chance to focus on things that we really care about. So that's really the heart of where I think cloud is going. In terms of technologies, the technologies are moving closer and closer to business process, closer and you know, higher and higher level, and they're, they're establishing amazing uh, capabilities. So, so in fact, yesterday, a group of us were playing with um, uh, chat GPT, and uh, we put in the question, write a sonnet um, about British Computer Society. And we were blown away by just what it was able to produce. Right? And that is, is in essence, drawing the essence of all the information that exists in the cloud, the capabilities of machine learning and AI, to be able to apply it in a way which is fabulous. Right? So, so that I'll, I can talk more about that, and that's enough for now, Ryan. Thank you, thank you, Rashid. Yeah, I, uh, the lyrics they come out with are actually quite impressive. Or they scanned as well, which which really surprised me. Um, uh, Christine, uh, same for you. A quick introduction, please, and your initial thoughts on on the future of cloud. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, well, I'm Christine Ashton, and uh, in my day job, I'm the CIO of a company called Sousa, and uh, we make um, we support um, open source uh, operating systems, container management, and security products to support edge computing and uh, you know I look after both the corporate functions and the processes as Rashid was just talking about and I also help support the products and the build service and uh, you know and how how people can consume that. I'm also a non-exec in financial services for the Royal Bank of Scotland International and obviously um, uh, I'm a member of uh, FTAG. Um, I mean Rashik, Rashik, it's like my life's work's dream to have, you know, compute come closer to business processes, you know, so the, so the more I see the future, I, I'm in the same place, you know, it just comes closer and closer to business processes. But I do think it's worth just standing back from it and just thinking about, I mean, just think about how much the cloud market will be worth, you know, in say 2030. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's slated to be worth well over a trillion. And and between now and then, it's slated to be growing at 15, 16% if you look across the sort of analysts, compound every year. So, I mean, that is, that is pretty amazing growth. And I think, I think the other thing is, you know, recent events have told us just how uh, infrastructure stability is, is just more important than ever to business continuity. And, you know, suddenly the cloud is just front and center of that, isn't it, really? Um, but I do think, and maybe we can explore it as we go, it's also worth just thinking about the future of it in terms of digital products and digital services versus corporate compute. And, and just thinking about, you know, if you're a developer or developing software now, how does it help you going forward and where does it start to go to versus if you may be just using software as a service or thinking about business processes. And, and what does that mean in terms of if things start to accelerate and you can do things much faster and produce software much faster, then you, know, you could argue that security uh, and, and the threat actor sort of landscape also gets faster and cleverer. So you know, it's, um, it's interesting to think of cloud, I think, A, the size of the market, how are you gonna come at it? And also that it's just not one thing for every advance you make in cloud, there's probably a counter advance in terms of uh, threat actors and uh, other things that uh, potentially could could challenge you and make you think harder about what you're doing, you know. Thank you, Christine. So, in fact, let's dig in uh, to a little bit more to the cybersecurity aspect, because that, that's often the thing that comes straight to mind in almost any IT uh, subject, isn't it? So. Um, 
before we just bring Rashiki in on, on some comments on that, I'd just like to mention to everybody that, as usual, please, if you want to, put in some chats to the q and I've already put a couple of things in chat about the Net Zero films I was mentioning, but if you have questions for the panel, please use the Q&A, and we'll stick those in as we go. But Rashid, can we start to just look into the cybersecurity side of things a little bit more? Yeah, so I think you know, as cloud technologies advance, um, our abilities to leverage that cloud technology to um, you know, penetrate cloud systems and, and actually uh, f you know, access data that we shouldn't be able to access and so on gets greater and greater. So um, any, any perpetrator wanting to do that has more resources to go and apply to that. So it's, it's, um, we always think of security as an arms race. Um, you have to get better and better. And as you get better and better, the perpetrators get more and more sophisticated. Um, the, the, um, the, the threat vectors continue to multiply. Um, some of the zero day issues are just unbelievable that they could even think of doing these, let alone not only think about it, but actually make it happen. And, and so you, know, you need to have professionals guiding you and supporting you on that whole journey. Um, and you can't do that. Um, yeah, if, if, you're, if, if you've got your own little data center, um, your ability to keep pace through that is getting um, less and less viable. Right? So you've got to really find ways of, of um, accessing that. And one of the things that as you get large cloud providers, their ability to invest in sophisticated um, <clears throat> uh, expertise and technology um, is, is you know, helpful and, and vital, but even that isn't always enough, right? So, so it's, 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 a, it's an arms race and we've got to continually <laughs> look for the best set of technologies <clears throat> and what you've got is shared knowledge right so, so through through a lot of the different techniques around we're sharing the knowledge on the threat vectors and making sure that we all know about what we can do that what we can do to protect ourselves um and and that's that's you know vital we've got a we've got a group around that yeah i think the other thing is as, as things get more complicated, and maybe if you just go from business processes back, as business processes get more integrated across companies and maybe across industries and suppliers and ecosystems, then also people are not just using one cloud. You know, in, in surveys of CTOs and CIOs, for example, people will say they're using at least three providers. So suddenly you've got that sort of complexity in the mix. And... And so I think in terms of the future, then I think we, we can expect to see more on confidential compute and more and better tools that can not just monitor things, but can also totally reassure us and provide almost the equivalent of a, some sort of cloud compliance data that show that there isn't anyone with backdoors into, into what we're trying to do, whether that's the manufacturer of the software or, or the cloud providers or anybody. And I think, that, I think that the more complex this all gets, the more we need to expect to see better tools, more sophisticated tools to manage it. And also, you know, to, to the point you challenged us with, Brian, I think in terms of skills, you know, that's something that, you know, if, if I was now thinking about my career in cloud, I would be really thinking about getting to understand this whole multi-cloud environment and, and getting to understand the tools, the techniques and the security that go, goes along with that, right? I, I know that we've yeah. covered this. And Brian, if I just, sorry. Brian, if I just add to that, I think um, the weakest link continues to be the individual, mm. right? And, and if you look at you know, phishing attacks or other attacks, we're, we're leveraging the, um, the nature of humans, the vulnerability of humans to, to make some of those attacks happen. So the, the more and more sophisticated we create the technologies behind the scenes, the users themselves, the, the humans in the, in the loop are the ones that are often the, the most vulnerable points. So you, you've, got to, you, you've got to have a multifaceted approach to security. You can't just rely on tools and technology. You've got to have training, process, discipline, um, and it's got to be repeated every day you know, because you, you, could, you could do the training this month and you forget next month, and, and all of a sudden you're a vulnerable and you're, you're, you're the weakest link. Yeah, or, or it can just become out of date, but the, you know, the speed, speed things are going. And I suppose, you know, um, 
the other thing we should also mention that as as cloud's scope expands and now you know edge compute is much more viable and you know you've got all sorts of devices connecting to hospitals to people you know all sorts of things as part of their ecosystems suddenly your, your attack surfaces are, are completely different aren't they and uh, quite uh, uh, quite extensive you know if you if you were just trying to secure say i don't know uh, a medical device in a hospital suddenly you've got a whole value chain to really think about right exactly and and coming back to critical infrastructure right you you take um you take perpetrators in in you know it's countries trying to attack other countries now through these kind of structures so there are the 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 the, the complexity of the security landscape is beyond the brainful and we need very sophisticated capabilities expertise and um and um structures to be able to to manage that so so the topic is probably when we can have a whole series of discussions on brown yeah absolutely i mean i was just going to mention the role of uh, machine learning and, and ai in 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 seeing patterns in in the attacks that go on um is that an area that we need to perhaps explore a little bit more because obviously what people whilst people are the weakest link they can't do everything christine well that, that is there to some extent no, now, isn't it? you know um so these tools are getting more sophisticated but I suppose what you're sort of pushing on is, and, I, and I'm just sort of uh, experimenting with this, as it were, is that, you know, maybe what you start to see in the future in the same way we've seen with networks, you know, software defined networks and, and self defining networks, maybe in the future we start to see self defining clouds, you know, actually mm. the cloud works out itself where to put itself, you know, and, um, and maybe that's what the future looks like, you know. Um, maybe we're just all completely out of the infrastructure going forward we've got much more sophisticated tools and ai instead of applying ai to business processes you know maybe we start to apply it really to the setting up of these uh, technical um uh, environments and these technical capabilities you know you know and that would be a very different way to start thinking about things mm. and, and to a certain extent christian we do have that if you think about serverless um, our ability to instantly uh, instantiate a, a, a serverless service, um, make that available on any cloud, um, and and scale that as demand grows, and then shrink it back when it's not needed. Um, if you look at some of the sophisticated workloads that sit behind uh, weather.com, for example, they have phenomenal amount of compute capability, and it dynamically moves between cloud providers. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's taken out depending upon where the workloads happen. So, so a lot of that is happening today. And even in the security landscape, we're using AI tooling to be able to understand the threat vectors, analyze them, and then figure out where to apply the human expertise to be able to um, plug some of those holes and start to understand the implications of those threat vectors. Yeah, so, so then what you start to maybe want AI to start doing for you is stress testing some of this stuff, you know? You know, in the same way we used to stress test the banks, <laughs> you know, you start to stress test this and start to look at your business processes and, and just ask yourself, how many third parties is it going through? Because you, you've got to also think through that uh, um, your processes are just not delivered either by your infrastructure. As you say, Rashi, your infrastructure might be moving around, your payload might be moving around. So it might be quite interesting to think about how you could dynamically stress test that if you like and how automation could help you to do that all the time thank you for that so um now james davenport couldn't be with us as i said earlier but he he put a couple of thoughts in for us to think about and i'm gonna i'm gonna throw one in now he talked about this idea of a shared security model and he he put this remark a, a problem shared is a problem with confused responsibilities but <laughs> is there a, a sort of circle to be squared there um, Rashid, do you have some thoughts on that one i know you saw that comment he made uh, yeah yeah no, absolutely and i think his point is very valid you've got to have clear roles and responsibilities in in the structure um, and and part of the shared data is as long as you um you, you know make sure that the responsibility for collating the data, understanding the data, picturing the data is, is managed in a, in a structured way, it can be very effective. Um, and, and so the notion of a security operations center 
as a single point of structure is, 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 a, is a growing uh, approach to managing complex multi-cloud platforms. Um, and, and I've been involved in setting up some of those and, and they are very, very effective. So, so you, you draw, you, you're kind of building on the shoulders of giants. So you're using the expertise that sits inside some of the cloud providers and then collating all of that into a structure which, which you then manage, you understand where the vulnerabilities are and you kind of oversee that and you're using AI tooling to help us do all of that. So, so it is, if you, if you don't, it's not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of work to be done there, but, but it, it can, if it's done well, it can be very, very good. If it's done badly, it can be an absolute disaster. Um, yeah, and Christine, you're saying you're looking at some of this this stuff, obviously in your in your in your day to day role. What's your view of the shared security model? Well, I think it's as, as Rashid said. You know, I think we've we've certainly not got it at the moment, right? But I mean, we've got some parallels, haven't we? You know, you've got things like uh, blockchain, and you've got ideas of how you can do these sorts of things and concepts that we could borrow from, right? And I suppose that's that's perhaps where the future starts to go, you know? Um, how do we actually make it much more sophisticated? Um, at the moment, we rely on profiles and secure edge and all sorts of things to secure, secure um, access and multi-factor. You know, it's all a bit messy, isn't it really? It's all a bit, it's very layered is perhaps the word. So mm. I, suppose, I suppose there's probably needs to be a bit more research into those sorts of areas as to how we can have this much more um, clear, and I know what you're saying, like a racy model, a very clear racy model for all of this. And, and maybe that's where we, you know, some of the research needs to be uh, provoked into, you know. Is, is there any indication from the current research in this area as to uh, any particular direction of travel for these things uh, then? And Rishi, do you have a thought on that? Ooh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so if I, if I kind of look at the research landscape, the, the, the research landscape is, is quite broad. It, um, some of it focuses on um, the systemic issues that sit in clouds. So, for example, net zero, how do we, how do we reduce the carbon footprint of cloud? Um, some of it is around programming models and how we program in cloud. Some of it is about bringing new capabilities in, like quantum. Uh, leveraging blockchain and those kind of things, and and there's a there's a big chunk of research around the developer and the operational ecosystem around multi-cloud. So, so I think the research landscape is quite broad, um, and and it, it looks at a spread of um, raw technology as well as the the um, application landscape. Uh, Dalim, you've got your hand up. Please um, talk. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just wondering something. In the same way as we've got the darknet and there's a whole load of stuff going on, and the research point is very relevant, we're constantly running after the bad guys. So is there, to your knowledge, such a thing as the dark cloud? And mm -hmm. are people researching and advancing fast across that particular landscape? Nice, nice question, Dalim. Thank you. I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the answer to the question is, the, yeah, so the answer to the question is yes, to a certain extent. I mean, you see that come together in conferences like um, uh, the Black Hat conferences, some of the other big security conferences where <clears throat> they pull together um, a, a kind of instrument infrastructure to be able to manage that. And it, it's a place that you don't go unless you, you're happy to get hacked because you're going to get hacked instantly. But, you know, there, there are there are all kinds of um, structures that are, are being built. And um, just as fast as we start to understand them, they move and shift and all, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very fast moving landscape from that perspective, I'd say. Chris? No, no, I'm just thinking the same. I mean, you know, the picture we're painting, I was just reflecting on the picture we're painting. It's, uh, it's, uh, it starts to become very much more, certainly much more sophisticated than what it is today, doesn't it? Much more multi, multifaceted in that sense and you know if, you know if you think about some of the work that's going on on confidential cloud and encrypted cloud and you know like I say Susa we, we, we provide um, operating systems and we you know we uh, we uh, you know that's our business and one of the things we've still not been able to do is is to get to cloud for the provision of those um, operating systems right so we still have to do that on-prem because that's the only way we can prove to our certifiers 
that nobody's touched that software, you know, because we're part of other people's supply chain, right? So when you think about it, and I often think about this, I often think, well, what would have to happen to enable us to be able to uh, use the cloud and enable people to download um, from our build service using the cloud? And, and there's quite a lot of things that would have to happen. A, you'd have to have true confidential cloud. You'd probably have to have some sort of encrypted cloud. And we've, we, we have been talking to some of the providers so far, but they still can't quite get there for us. And, and I suppose, you know, if you think about banks, financial services, they're still trying to create sort of confidential cloud, but using today's tools and techniques. And, uh, and that's probably gonna be the big change, you know, whether you call it dark cloud, I love that actually, uh, whether you call it dark cloud going forward. To me, that's the big change. It's totally confidential. There's only you can see it, irrespective of who provides it. And you know exactly who's in, who's not in, who's touched it, who hasn't touched it. And maybe it has its own way of, um, you know, making sure that, it, that it's safe. So that, that's quite a sophisticated shift from where we are. And if I just add to that, Brian, you know, one of the big um, focus areas of development in, uh, in, in cloud research is uh, homomorphic encryption. And the idea here is that you can have confidential data, you can manipulate it, you can do analysis on it, but nobody can actually see the data apart from the individuals that are authorized to see that data. And, and so if you can imagine kind of sharing confidential data across two organizations and be able to share secrets, you know, trade secrets, if you like, um, but but only get to see the data that is yours and you're allowed to see. I mean, these are some really exciting advances, and, and you can see the kind of use cases that come from that is uh, is pretty phenomenal. It's certainly a move on from having a secret server, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, I, I want to thank uh, Dan for that question. Uh, as I say, I wish I'd thought of it. I'm going to steal the phrase "dark uh, cloud" for uh, for IT now. So uh, look out for that. Um, we've had another question come in from uh, uh, Marcellus Brown, just talking about uh, uh, access. Uh, he, he's talking about, um, well, I'll read it. I'm thinking of the old days where systems programmers had access to everything and the users had closely defined access. Now we are clearer defined on who access is what. Are there new competing methodologies on how to define and control access to data, objects, services, and applications? Who'd like to pick that one up? I see Rashid nodding. Uh, yeah, so, so we're, we're moving towards what we call fine-grained access, which is um, data, with the service with a with a particular moment in time you're allowed to have access and that access is, is time limited so very very fine grain control and access is, is is where we're heading and again that's a big topic for research how do we do that affordably consistently and uh, and reliably yeah that that's 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 um certainly a, an area that many uh, institutes are trying to understand and develop and, and that kind of notion of just in time fine grain access is is certainly something that uh, that's super exciting, but it, it then requires a very sophisticated set of processes to be able to, to use that as well, right? Um, and yeah, if you can um, if you can start to imagine that as a something that's 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 normal practice, a kind of notion of of um, passwords becomes very arcane. So you need to have you know token based um, security, and tokens are, are there for for again that for that defined period. Um, and it, and it and it covers you know, multi it's, it's, it's a very it's a very interesting and, and fascinating model that we're seeing evolving here. Yeah, Marcellus, oh, well, it was, uh, uh, sorry, IBM was the original token, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> so so that's a that's a certainly a shift on, isn't it? Wow. I mean, when you think about it at the moment, there's a lot of mistakes with cloud due to misconfigurations and also you know people do accidentally. Uh, lose their passwords and publish things in GitHub they probably weren't supposed to do and whatever. So actually having some sort of access like that, like you say, fine-grained and time-based and um, maybe maybe based on some sort of quite um, just-in-time uh, access model, whether that's a data access model or, or function access model, uh, I mean, that would be revolutionary. It'd be revolutionary for developers, but also think about it for, for uh, banks and anybody that's that needs first second and third third line defense um you know and um you know things for um 
you know, just tracking your in compliance and, and all sorts of things. I mean, that would be uh, pretty exciting as well. I can think about lots of use cases for that. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcellus had another question, actually, also security oriented. I think we've touched on this, but just to maybe we can expand. Have we got any ideas of the entities that a security methodology needs to address in this in this new world? I'm going to call it a brave new world. Um, Christine, any further thoughts on that? The entities. Yeah. What do we think we mean by entities? I would, I always think as well, government, um, you know, sort of uh, rogue states and that sort of thing myself, but I might have misread that. Rashid. No, no. So in this context, I think we're looking at entities as, as a as a process, uh, data entity, ah. as a, ah, okay. a de device. Um, and, and so y y all of those things, all of the above, right? You, you're down at the level of individual data items, um, individual components in your cloud provider, individual microservices that you might have. Uh, they all need to be kind of thought through and 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 uh, the securities be, be managed accordingly. Ah. Yeah, but you know what, Rash? What I'm thinking though is, it, if you were if you're going to go down that route, <clears throat> um, you kind of fine grain in the organisation to use your term, and you're fine grain in your data and how it supports your processes. So you couldn't just fine grain your clouds and your security, right? It sort of moves on, right? And, and then you say to yourself, well, we've just done these massive transformations of getting businesses to shift to cloud and people are adopting maybe standard business processes. But then we're going to take it to a potentially another level of gain in terms of um, almost like group access controls on steroids across business processes. That's a heck of a change for potentially for organizations that often don't know what data they've got, don't know who can access it. And they're just often, and we've all done it, just rely on perimeter protection just to <laughs> keep everything safe. So it's a- but, but, you think, but you think about what happens, you know, you, you, you have some small business that creates some super cool, um, you know, Christmas, um, um, uh, Christmas muffins in somewhere in the middle of nowhere. <clears throat> all of a sudden they get become trendy and that, that person has got to then supply them instantly to the whole world because that's the trendy thing in the moment and, and this notion of, of, of instantaneous need for something that's become very popular means you have processes and organization structure which have got to be very very elastic right and and they they become linked to um supply chains which which emerge in a very short amount of time serve a particular purpose and then and then get pulled down and that requires a technology underpinning that, and that requires a security underpinning. So the, the whole layering from the, the kind of instant gratification society we live in and, and the structures believe that drives this fine grain need. So it's, it's, it's not something that we can avoid. It's, it's something that's happening, whether we like it or not. Wow. I mean, you know, and we talk a lot today about using, for example, software as a service, whether that's an ERP or a, a sales and marketing front end and, and sticking with the standard processes. Kind of what we're saying is, as things move into the future and get more fine grain, actually starting to do that now would actually be a good, a good way to move forward in probably with less process debt, maybe not so much technical debt, maybe less process debt. So, so it's quite interesting, isn't it? The way everything is potentially going to become in finer and finer resolution from processes all the way through uh security uh access control all sorts of things interesting vision of the future there thank you thank you for that and thank you for those uh, questions uh, marcella so appreciate that so any other questions please uh keep them coming into the little q a section i'd like to just move on to a little bit of a conversation about the sustainability uh, side of things now the, the the little film i just popped in the chat there um talks a little bit about our it's partly about our personal use of, of cloud and how much simple things like photographs we put up there but obviously it applies to enterprise as well where there's a lot of duplication of data storage and things like that is there an argument as um organizations consider their tra uh, continue their transformation journey and, and think about their strategies that they, there should be a rebalancing between what goes on the cloud and maybe what should be back on for want of a better expression personal storage you know we, we in the old days we called them winchesters didn't we but uh, 
Um, Which is, is, there there going back a bit. <laughs> it is a little bit, yeah. <laughs> is, is there a rebalancing of, of how we view that? I'm not because cloud's here to stay. We know that. But what about the balance between cloud and, and on-premises then? Let's, let's put it that way. Rashik. So, so let, let's start with the basics of how we store this stuff, because um, if you look at many of the cloud providers, they're looking at tape to store a lot of this information because tape is still by far the cheapest way of, of retaining a lot of this, um, <clears throat> this, this information. You, you, you go now, once upon a time, taking a photograph, you'd be kind of careful, make sure you framed it right and you just take one photo. Mm. Now you'll take 10 clicks and those 10 clicks are, are not just low resolution there, they're the highest resolution possible because you might want it. Right? Nobody ever goes back and looks at whether those, that data, the, those pictures were needed or not. Nobody ever cleans that up, right? You, you're relying on, on just keeping that. So we, we yeah, last, get, last count, there's 40 exabytes of data in the world and we're doubling that every, every year or so. Right. And, and, and then you look at what does that mean? So, so we're running machine learning algorithms against that ever increasing amount of data, right? We're doubling the AI net, uh, carbon footprint every three months, every three months. Just think about that, right? That, that, that's going to get to a point very quickly where the, um, the, the microscope and that, well, the, the spotlight is going to be on, on AI and saying, how do we reduce the carbon footprint of that? Good news is there's work going on on that space. So you look at things like um, the Tensor chip that Google have produced or some of the AI chips that different people are producing, ARM have created and so on. But there's, there's great technology being created to try and reduce the carbon footprint. But it comes back to we need to have better ways of deciding which out of those 10 photographs we actually want to keep, right? So yeah. that, that's, that's kind of key to that. Mm. I also think, Brian, that you've got to look at these things end to end. And I'm always a big fan of use cases and outcomes, right? So, you know, if I'm a big store manufacturer, a big, a big uh, retail, online retail, and if my, I worry about my balancing my storage like we've just described, but if every, every two of my deliveries is a return, when you gross it up, it, it, yeah. it, it's not good. If, if I'm still using my uh, storage right, and maybe I'm using cloud and I'm relying on a cloud provider, who's also incentivized to be efficient because that's how they make their money. And every one of my deliveries is a right first time. You're kind of in a slightly different space, right? So I, I do think that if we start sort of cherry picking it, you, you, you could come to all sorts of answers. And I think, you know, when you just look at, even if Rash keeps 48 photos of, it, of his, his, his dog or whatever, even if he keeps 48 photos of his dog, if, if he's not traveling to work or he's not on the train or whatever, then overall, does it, does it balance out better? Question mark, you know? Is it, is it, is it your dog Rashik or is it a lot of selfies? That's, that's what I'm asking, but. Uh... Well, I don't have a dog, so it's definitely not the dog. But... <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I had a dog. But I mean, I mean, I do have but a data usually center. Usually selfies. I do have a data center and I use a, a colo provider. And you know, that colo provider has gone to a lot of trouble to make sure that the energy is recycled, um, that, you know, uh, something like 90 odd percent of the energy is provided through, you know, the equivalent of air, air source pumps and stuff like that. So, and the cooling, uh, heating and cooling. So I think that if we put our mind to it, we can make these things work. And I think if we, if we think of it as end to end, like I've just said, then mm. I think it probably works. I think uh, if you pick it apart, it's probably uh, not the way to do it. We probably need a different set of metrics and thoughts to do all this sort of stuff, right? Well, perhaps I'm going to do the same thing again here, but maybe then the question goes back to the to the, the point of provision that um, do people actually, do organisations pay enough attention to where they get their services from? Because obviously if you've got a, a data centre sunk in the ocean of Norway, it's going to be much more naturally cooled, for example, isn't it, than the one that might be stuck in the middle of Nevada. For example, I'm just um, spitballing. Or Iceland. Iceland is the new place for them, isn't right. it? Right, right. Uh, so so you know, do people pay enough attention to where they source their um, their service? I think so. Yeah, I think so. And, and the, and the, I mean, people are putting data centers underwater now because, again, that's a cooler place to be. So you can you can get faster cooling through that. So there's different strategies that there are. I think pretty much anything you can think of, somebody's trying it somewhere. 
Okay. I think it's more about getting really clear about the rest of the things that layer on it and how efficient all they are, you know, and um, and making sure that you're using providers that can optimize the workload across other companies and you're not you're not using like loads of reserve capacity for example you know yeah. you know and maybe it's just little things like that you know that that help okay thanks now marcellus has put uh, thank you marcellus you're putting some good questions in here this one's about um uh, blending customers and suppliers i'll read this out uh, uh he said he was on a project where he was overseeing suppliers i set up a share point where we had authorized users owning everything then suppliers with their own areas and other areas where suppliers could collaborate if a mistake occurred, the term was data spill, and there was a business process to resolve the issue. Now, this was a model of the customer, supplier one, supplier two. In the brave new world, how do we manage to blend that blend of customers and suppliers? We'd like to pick that one up. Does that, that question chime, Rashik? Yeah, you know, this is a, it's a complex question. There's no easy answer to this. Um, you, you've got to really sort of work through this piece by piece and say, Hey, what well, what do we want to achieve through that collaboration? You know, do I do I create a a kind of blockchain with the rules embedded in the blockchain because that's been used as a as a technique, or do I use some form of um, you know security structure to manage the access control? Um, you know, a simple SharePoint uh, may not be uh, may, may not be sufficient in 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 providing you the options and and various configurations you, you soon get yourself in 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 you know tie yourself in knots trying to figure out which is what access control needs to go where for whom because mm -hmm. the hierarchy is there so, so i think th things like smart contracting structures which sit inside blockchains um i think that's a good way to think about those those kind of structures okay thank you christine well, all I was thinking of was was similar to Rash, really. You know, suppliers, supermarkets, suppliers, logistics have been do doing this stuff pretty effectively for years, and they're getting more sophisticated. But they're quite clear about what data can be exchanged and under what conditions. So I suppose it is about thinking through use cases with this stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dallin's got his hand up. We, we've just got a few minutes left, folks. So if you have any other questions, please put them in. Dallin's got his hand up. So let's go to Dallin. Okay, thank you very much. Right, I call this scrambled cloud. I'm thinking of three things. One, bombing another country by use of Google Maps or whatever. Is it feasible for the cloud to act as a scrambling mechanism? Like in wartime, you know, you remove the signposts and all that sort of stuff. It makes it much more difficult to find uh, targets. That's number one. Number two is what about URLs? We're under threat and our company data is likely to be mangled or whatever we hear. Is it possible to scramble those in the, uh, in the cloud, maybe even store it somewhere else in the cloud to help security on that front? And of course, the big picture that's around all of this is data, scrambling data in the cloud, maybe relocating to other clouds and so on. Are these things being done or are they possible? Thanks, Dalim. Rashik's looking thoughtful. Would you like to take that one, Rashik? Sure. So in terms of scrambling, um, let's just step back a bit. We, we can do encryption. Um, the, the, the trick with encryption is it's the payloads that need to be encrypted, right? And, and you can encrypt those payloads with, um, with, with, with the traditional kind of RSA type techniques. And, and that's okay. You get to quantum. And uh, with quantum, if, if we get sufficient quantum capacity and it's that broadly sense, then in theory, not in practice today, in theory, we should be able to uh, very rapidly uh, identify the encryption keys and so break all that encryption. So, so we have to find different ways of managing that encryption and that encryption technology. So that's why techniques like lattice encryption or um, of changing or dynamically changing um, uh, encryption uh, keys. There's, there's different techniques being researched in each of these areas. Um, and there are some, some technologies that are out there at the moment. Um, are they all you know, production ready? Personally, I don't know. I've not looked in them in detail. But I think, I think there are enough pieces of the story that mean we can do a lot of what Dalim's trying to do in terms of encrypting the payloads 
as it as it transitions through the, the structures. And, and in terms of raw encryption, a lot of financial data is encrypted before it gets sent out of the data center. It's only in the clear in very limited places where where you've got a very uh, secure enclave to be able to do that. Everywhere else, the data is encrypted. Now, in terms of URL encryption, that's an interesting idea. Um, you, you know, because ultimately the URL is about finding its way from a source to a destination. You need to know what the destination is, otherwise how are you going to get to it? Um, I think everything other than the destination could be encrypted. And Christian, I don't know what your thoughts are here. Well, I think it's, I mean, I like the almost scrambling clouds. I mean, it's sort of what cloud was always originally billed as, right? Remember, you could, it's almost like, you remember the Black Fridays where you had scaling capacity, so you never ran out of capacity. So that was a sort of maybe an early form of scrambling clouds. Quick, it's, it's Black Friday. We need limitless capacity because people are going to buy lots of stuff from us. But, but I think the idea of uh, scrambling it for certain use cases or scrambling it to be able to roll things out and deploy things, different use cases, I think that's very interesting. And when you take into account the edge, um, you know, that, 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 that could be really interesting, especially if you had sort of automatic scrambling, <laughs> you know, so it sort of did it itself to increase, um, uh, to increase your capacity. That would be quite interesting. Or as you were just rolling out. So maybe you could just have crowd scrambling as automatic uh, rolling out of things, you know, to people, Aut automatic rolling out of software or capabilities or whatever. So I think that's quite an interesting concept. So we've, we've got some good ones tonight. We've got the fine grain, we've got the black clouds, we've got the cloud scrambling. Um, so I think that's all, all interesting. Um, and like you say, Rash, I think we've got all the bits we can start to put them together. I think probably what we almost need to do, we've sort of had wave one of clouds, wave two, and we're probably into waves three or four of it now. It's probably worth just standing think, back and really thinking through what some yeah, of the we, use cases probably, now could be um, for. We're probably going to end up new so, combinations. So I think we're going to, yeah, yeah. I think we're going to end up with a fine-grained, um, scrambled um, um, uh, um, dark cloud. That's what oh, we're yeah. ending up. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good summing up. Thank you. So um, I'm going to say thanks very much to Christine Rashik. Thank you, um, all, all the attendees, for your questions. It, it, Christine Rashik, is there any sort of final thing you'd like to say, you know, if, you, if you've got some considerations that you really must take with you from this evening, if you just look at it, this stuff, what, what, what's the sort of one or two key things that people should be taking away? For, for, for me, the two key things is, one, automate the hell out of everything that we do. In fact, two things. To always, uh, always expect the unexpected, because vulnerabilities come from where you don't expect them. And, and the third thing is, focus on driving towards solving real business issues, because that's where the, where it makes a difference. Thank you, Rashid. Yeah. Christine. I'm not sure I could add to that actually, because that's <laughs> that's pretty pretty cool. But I was just going to say, you know, the journey isn't over yet with cloud. It's, it's definitely yeah. not. We haven't got to the destination yet. And the other thing I was going to say is, I think don't underestimate that we still need to understand how it all works, because as the new tools come in, you still need to have that mental model of how it all works. And, and I think that following uh, some of these training courses and certifications, you know, certified cloud security architect um, are probably going to be good things, because I, I still think even though it gets smarter and cleverer, architecture is going to be enduring and understanding how how it works as the model matures is going to be enduring and and really understanding where all these tools all fit together so uh like i say uh, it's not over yet and uh, don't forget you know it's really important to still understand how it all works brilliant thank you christine thank you rashik so much we appreciate that thank you everyone that's paid, uh, paid attention tonight and asked questions we'll look forward to the fine-grained scrambled uh uh, Black Cloud. Dallin, did you want to have a, a, a sign-off remark uh, from, from the branches at all? Um, yes, that's great. Thank you. Well, I think that's been really wonderful. And this is just a little, re little reveal about the wealth of talent there is in the BCS and also how far we have to go on this wonderful journey with the cloud, but also with IT in general. And of course, Where's the best place to take the train to board uh, uh, to board and get get this journey done? 
at the BCS, the Chartered Institute of IT. So do come and join us. Do come and be part of all this. Let's carry on. The journey continues.